All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we're gonna get started. So this same presentation we've done it, it's the second time today. We're trying to capture as many people uh, in different time uh, zones as possible. And I wanted to start with a quick uh, mini disclaimer. It's been probably the most challenging presentation I've ever had to prepare. And there are two, well, there are multiple reasons, uh, but one of them is that the audience we have here today is extremely varied, okay, in the degree of experience. So we have people that may have never worked with CT, they are just considering buying one. And in the other end of the spectrum, I've just seen that there's a, at least one radiologist other than me, uh, which I wonder what they're gonna learn tonight. I don't think much. Um, so that trying to find a common denominator or something that may interest such a, a wide audience is very difficult. And the other one is cultural differences. Uh, I was really looking through the, through the list of people registered. We have, I think, 27 different countries and from the six uh, different continents. So from all over the world, except Antarctica, which is uh, quite overwhelming, to be honest. Now, um, the reason why that may be relevant, we're going to be talking about imaging indications. And there are very clear differences from one country or one continent to the other. We will mention some of those. But uh, sometimes, you know, saying this is the modality of choice. Uh, may apply to your workload, to the type of cases you see, the type of patients, uh, the, the, the specific owner requirements, and may not necessarily apply uh, to everyone. The other challenge is the topic is very broad and I have less than an hour. Uh, it's supposed to be 45 minutes plus a uh, question and answers. It's gonna be more likely, like, like, yeah, closer to the one hour. And then we can stay a little bit longer. If you have any questions, we'll try to, to answer them. So it's been very difficult. And I, when I realized how uh, broad and, and different uh, audience we have here. I wanted to first clarify something very quickly, which may not be obvious to everyone. I'm going to be talking about CT, and by that I mean conventional or multi-detector CT. If you've got a, a cone beam, flat panel, or any other kind of uh, technology that is not really exactly that, uh, please understand that what we are going to discuss may not necessarily apply. In fact, it will not uh, apply for all of it. Okay, the, the indications are a little bit different. And how do you know? Well, this is an image of a, of a typical a conventional scanner. So it's quite a big bulky machine with a hole in the middle and the patient is fed by a tabletop uh, that moves in and out. Generally, that's what they look like. And also uh, you may recognize the brands because these are brands that not only do CT scanners, they are big corporations generally, uh, GE, Siemens, Toshiba, Canon. So names that you may know from, uh, you know, from having a, 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 a photographic uh, equipment or, or other things used not a CT scanner. There are some exceptions to this uh, in the way the machines look. Some are smaller and portable, and someone may have a, a rather obscure or unknown uh, name. Uh, but again, uh, they will still have to be kind of conventional or multi-detector for, for what we're going to discuss to apply. And just looking at the title, I, I think maybe this was what uh, some people was expecting. We're going to talk a lot about expectations, you know, when you decide um, uh, imaging modality. And I want to make sure you don't have the wrong expectations. And if you do, I apologize. Um, but uh, when you want to decide imaging modalities, this would be what is ideal and what some people would love to have. And I know some people prepare this and give them away, but they are very dangerous. And here is like a plot of different modalities versus body area. So if you've got a thorax, you do this. If you don't have them and you have that. All the times I've seen this with rather than body areas with the specific diseases. If you've got elbow dysplasia, you do this. If you've got a cruciate, you do that. And this is just way too simplistic. And very often the decisions uh, in imaging uh, are, are multifactorial. It's not just one factor against the other. Uh, there are many, many other considerations. Now, uh, you, if you are, I'm assuming many of you will be veterinarians and, and many of you will actually work with patients directly, you not know, as radiologists, which I'm not even sure I'm a vet anymore. <laughs> I don't know if I qualify as one because I, I, I tend not to see patients or very rarely when I pop into a hospital to do ultrasound. Uh, but you are gonna be confronted with a patient and from that patient, you are going to do a thorough clinical exam if it lets you. And you're going to have some questions to ask and discuss with the client. And it is based on this that you're going to decide uh, whether further investigations are required. And, and in many cases, it will, be, uh, it will be needed. So whether it's based on, I don't know, blood samples and endoscopy or imaging, which is what we are going to be focusing. Uh, but you start to get the idea that imaging is just a very small part of uh, one of the, of the pieces in this puzzle. Okay. So it's going to have lots of uh, variations. It's going to depend on the results of those in what you find in your clinical examination and so on. And yeah, with the hope that uh, this will give you a final diagnosis, you can set up a prognosis, talk back to the client or to the pet owner, set up a treatment, and maybe, only maybe, uh, you know, be able to, to help uh, that patient. 
uh, but it just shows that imaging is only going to be a very small uh, part of the whole investigation. So before jumping into CT, I just wanted to make uh, some more broad comments about decision making in diagnostic imaging. Uh, the first one is the, of that decision is whether it's going to be necessary at all. That's obvious for any other investigations that you do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, the idea, and, and maybe one of the differences with diagnostic imaging, particularly with advanced, so CT, MRI, things like that, is that they tend to be very expensive. So you want to make sure that the decision is correct, that you don't do something uh, that could be avoided or that you do it and then you realize that maybe another uh, there was another way to, to kind of use those funds uh, to, to the benefit of the patient rather than doing that investigation. And I think to decide whether it's, it's, it's indicated, sometimes I, I even do this, we, we give advice about indications that we take a piece of paper and I would say, okay, we have this problem or this challenge, we are gonna do this modality. And basically there has to be multiple branches coming out of it. There has to be different outcomes. So let's say this modality, the CT is gonna confirm the disease or it's gonna tell us everything is normal. And what is important is to realize what comes after that. It has to be that the different results will affect differently the decision-making process, the treatment options uh, will be reassessed, or the outcome of the, of, of the whole case will, will depend on that decision. If you come to the conclusion that uh, whatever the results of the imaging are, potentially you're not gonna do anything different, there is when you really have to go back and try to see uh, if there are other approaches or things to do first. And uh, as a radiologist, I mean, I, I see my role as, as just being supporting staff to, to clinicians that are, uh, you know, that have patients in charge or so to our clients. And I, I you know, this is part of our reports. If you are clients, uh, you will see that when you submit a clinical history, we've got a section where we ask you, what do you want to achieve with this study? Which questions do you actually have? Just to make sure that our reports and our interpretations are valid and they, they help you move forward with, with that case. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, like very often, we don't get that question. Some people leave that empty. And other times, we do get questions that are potentially not the correct ones, mostly because imaging cannot answer them. So it's not unusual for someone to, you know, find, find a lump, a mass in an abdomen, and they send it to us, and the question is, is this a tumor? Or, you know, you start a random example that we sometimes get, does the dog have Cushing's? Uh, it's important to understand what imaging does and what it doesn't. Imaging is not a microscope. We cannot tell you if it's a tumor generally. We will have a suspicion. We may be able to, to do a, a prioritized list of differentials as to which one seems more likely, but ultimately that's uh, done with a microscope, not with a, with a scanner, okay? And other ones like, you know, does the dog have Cushing's? Well, what do I know? That's a biochemical and a clinical diagnosis. Uh, the CT may tell you if there is a mass and if maybe the other adrenal, for example, is atrophied, but still that does not mean the dog has Cushing's. The questions that uh, imaging, most of the modalities we use are gonna answer really are others. Like for example, is this resectable? Uh, can we actually get a sample safely? Um, is there treatment response? Like is the dog getting better or is the mass growing? Has it spread to other organs? Those are kind of more down the line. So before you set on this, on this journey of trying to investigate a case, make sure that your expectations are correct. Now, once you set up and decide about the justification, the next step is obviously modality choice. And this gets more and more complicated as time goes by because uh, there are more modalities that pop up and some of them keep, uh, keep evolving. So radiographs, probably the most widely available. Everybody knows about it. And now we're gonna look at the stifle with different modalities. You can see there's a lot of ways to look at the same anatomy. So for example, an ultrasound and just ultrasound, I mean, this B mode, M mode, color, pulse wave, continuous wave, power Doppler, contrast, uh, there's elastography, there is an awful lot of stuff to be done. Uh, then we've got CT and MRI, which is what we tend to call these advanced imaging modalities. And we're gonna be focusing on CT today. And these four are probably the ones that come to mind when people think of imaging and they all have a common denominator. They are all uh, structural or anatomical uh, tools. This, this allows us to see what the patient looks like, but uh, they all lack information when it comes to actual uh, function. It doesn't really tell us if that organ is working. There are other imaging modalities, nuclear medicine. We could add more there, for example, PET scans, uh, like proton emission and things like that, which do have some information regarding function, okay? So with so much available, you know, you may be lucky actually and only have one or two of these and that choice is gonna be simplified. But for all of the others, it's not gonna be a categorical clear, okay, this is always a CT, this is an MRI. There is gonna be many other things. So other than the modality itself, what do you have available? Okay, so MRI may be great for, for, for 
for brains, but if you need to put the dog in an airplane because you are in an island in Hawaii or, 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 or you know, in, in close to the North Pole up there, well, uh, it's all very good, but you know, CT is maybe gonna have to do. So that decision depends on what is available to you and how much it costs. It will also depend uh, as well in things such as what the client, how much do they want to, to progress with the case? You know, they, if they are not gonna remove a tumor. You may not need to assess the margins, for example. Now, the case, uh, other case specific things is like it just does not depend only on the specific indication, you know, what condition you are suspecting, but other simple practical things such as, yes, for this condition, a CT would be great, but if I sedate this dog, I kill it. So you are going to maybe consider uh, doing something else and start with something, you know, accept a compromise, but, uh, but keep it safe for your patient. And just as this is not all enough of, of factors to take into account, there is personal preferences. It's like, some clinicians or some radiologists, because of what we are used to, because our previous experiences, we may prefer a modality over the other. And I was trying to think of examples, for example, for, for uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors. I love CT, I, it's my, it's my, it's my go-to modality. And this can be very controversial. Other people who say, no, no, definitely no MRI. But ultimately there are no real good um, studies for all of these things so that you know, no, actually this is the modality that is best. Personal preference, uh, it does play a role. So now after reviewing those kind of, kind of general guidelines about decision-making in imaging, we're gonna move on to more specific body areas. I've broken the head into two because they are quite different. So neurocranium, so neurologic brain uh, stuff and everything that is around the head that is outside the cranial cavity. So nose, ears and so on. I will very briefly, and I may skip uh, the spine because we are planning on doing another lecture like this one where we are gonna do a bit more CT versus uh, MRI, where I think the spine will be covered in more detail. We are going to touch and we'll start with the limbs, uh, musculoskeletal, and then do a bit of thorax and abdomen. We cannot review all of the indications. This would be me just reading a massive long list. So we are just going to pick some examples where, for example, CT would be an excellent choice, and other examples of disease that, or, or, or body areas that seem similar, but where CT would probably be the last thing you want to consider. Okay, so just a little bit of a, of a review. Generally speaking, I think everybody knows this. It doesn't matter how much you've been exposed to CT. Uh, CT is great for bones, right? It almost feels like it's, it's been invented for things such as bones, teeth, and anything that is dense and sharply demarcated, it works great. And an example of a disease where I think it's perfectly reasonable to forget, like radiographs or whatever it is, and jump straight into CT, I think uh, elbow, for example, pathology is a good, is a good one. Radiographs may still play a role, uh, even when you have access to CT, maybe you've got a dog, you don't know where it's limping and you start to do radiographs of everything until you find something. But generally speaking, once you know a dog is lame in the elbow, CT is likely to be the most rewarding and cost-efficient modality. And the reason is that, you know, it shows everything you need to know generally when assessing elbow dysplasia. And, you know, you, you can see that at a stage where, where it would be totally impossible to even think that you can start to see it on a radiograph. CT, for example, medial coronary process disease, way before there is a fragment, very early stages of subchondral resorption show really, really nicely. And other things that on radiographs you can see, you know, technically you can see elbow incongruity, but I think we used to say something such as, you know, to see it confidently and make sure that that's genuine, is, it has to be at least two millimeters a step. So for example, what we see the distance between these two arrows. The, the joint space uh, is, is almost a millimetric. Two millimeter step is absolutely huge, okay? So with radiographs, something that you cannot be even sure if it is there, with CT looks absolutely massive, okay? So, so CT is far superior for elbow. And for the very same reasons, when you are looking at certain complex osseous lesions such as fractures, carpus and tarsi, these are very difficult to look in radiographs, digits, or even when you assess angular limb deformities, although maybe for different reasons, CT is absolutely brilliant to the point that it may be reasonable in many, many cases or most cases to use a skip, for example, the radiographs yeah, to avoid, avoid costs because chances are the CT is gonna give you all the information you need. Just a random example, for example, here we've got a, a dog with OCD in the talus and another OCD here in the malleolus. We may be lucky and see this on radiographs, uh, but you know, if there is a joint mice, for example, or assess the degree of DGD, there's lots of things that, that the CT will allow us to do that uh, radiographs won't. And for things such as uh, angular limb deformities, uh, one of the main reasons is that these images, we can reconstruct them into a 3D volume. And it means that uh, what in the past they did with radiographs, and this is 
repeatability of these measurements is, is impossible. I mean, you retake these radiographs few degrees off and all of the angles are, are quite different. They still managed to achieve good results, but now, you know, they could print that bone, physically hold it, plan the cuts, uh, get a specifically three-dimensional guide. So when they go to theater, they know where exactly to cut and where to put those screws. So they can, you know, practice the surgery before actually they cut the leg, okay? So these are very clear indications for CEP. Now, moving past bone, we all know is great. Soft tissue, you know, is not great, but it is not all that bad. There are many soft tissue injuries, uh, such as abscesses, uh, penetrating injuries, or, or searching for foreign bodies, or maybe just assessing margins of neoplasia to, to know if it can be resected. CT can be very good. Uh, I cannot illustrate every single indication, but I thought this was, you know, to show in a pre-contrast CT when it's properly done and you've got good resolution, uh, how you can see, this is normal here, the second image, and you can see the deep and the superficial uh, flex or tendons. You can see they are both, they've snapped, they've broken here. And I think in the dorsal is prettier, you see all the tendon going down and, you know, giving the little tendon to each digit, and you can see the, where, where, where it's broken, where it's, where it's, it's split, okay? So you do get to see quite a lot of things. Arguably, you know, particularly for peripheral stuff, ultrasound is also extremely useful. And MRI is technically superior, but it comes at a, at a much added uh, higher cost and longer acquisition times and so on. Um, the exceptions. So why don't we use it for every single bone or joint? Well, there are very uh, good examples. And the same way as an elbow makes sense to jump straight into CT for a stifle, it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, why? Well, most stifle lamenesses, at least in the caseloads that I'm used where I, where I live currently in England, uh, in the UK are a cruciate diseases. It's a degenerative disease that affects soft tissue components. And, you know, all the information that most surgeons that I know require is there on the radiographs. And the information that is not there, they're gonna find it anyway, because, you know, yeah, there could be a, I don't know, a meniscal injury, uh, but they don't need to know beforehand because they're gonna open the joint generally anyway, and they're gonna look at it. So the very vast majority of stifle lamenesses, whether first opinion or referrals, they do not get any, any cross-sectional imaging. And the cross-sectional imaging will be reserved for cases where there is something odd. This is not just average cruciate, there is a mass, there is some kind of OCD, a fracture, avulsions, whatever it is. Keep this place at the same. I think radiographs are so cost-effective, allow you to do distraction, for example, if you need to diagnose it early. Um, Technically, CT is, is, is better. I mean, you are going to see everything in more detail. Uh, but if, I, if I'm honest to you, when I, when I report CTs of the, of the hips uh, for dysplasia, what I do is we do some trickery with the images, we do something called mean intensity projections, and I turn the CT into a really poor quality radiograph <laughs> and work from there. So I think it would be very difficult to start to say, okay, every single case needs a CT for hip dysplasia. So you can see how, you know, what may work for an elbow choice-wise is totally different for the hind limb generally. And the same for metabolic bone disease, panosteitis, polyarthritis. Is it easy to justify a CT? I think in most cases it is not. And as we mentioned before, uh, remember CT, the same as MRI, is purely anatomical. The one thing that it doesn't do, it, it doesn't localize the clinical signs, okay? It will not tell you how relevant a lesion is. It's just excellent at finding every single issue that happens in a bone, but it's not good at telling you whether it's lame or not. The reason why I'm saying this is particularly if you're starting up with CT, it's very tempting to start to scan things where it's difficult to justify. So you've got a dog, you know, you cannot localize the lemnase, it's either the front or the back leg, and then you do a carpus elbow, shoulder, pelvis, stifle, tarsus CT. And, and that brings lots of issues. Mostly, yeah, it's not only just not cost effective, uh, it, it's very poorly rewarding. Most of the time, it's not going to tell you what you've got. But what happens is that it confuses the clinician, it confuses the clients because you had a dog that, you know, I think it's the elbow, but let's just do the carpus and the shoulder as well. And now you've got a dog that is lame. It's got indeed, as you suspected, elbow pathology, but it happens to have a calcified supraspinatus tendon and it's got a, I don't know, DJD in the carpus and a multipartite sesamoid. And now you are lost. Now you don't really know. So what do I do now? You had one problem, hoping for one problem. Now you've got three. And this can be uh, definitely very misleading. You will have the cases where you cannot localize the lameness, you know, stoic patients that don't show a pain, aggressive animals that you cannot examine. But um, those multi-joint kind of CT safari adventures that you, you, you are really like in the blind with a stick, like, you know, like you're trying to find something there, uh, they, they can be a little bit dangerous. The other reason I mentioned that is because as radiologists, we hate them. And, you know, I had to do this for my, for my colleagues. 
Uh, and yeah, that's what, what uh, in, in English they call the, the red herrings. So those things that are there used to distract you, to mislead you. And, and, and CT is very, very well known for this. I mean, you start to do full body CTs in an older, I don't know, boxer, you're gonna find a, a lamp and a nodule in every other organ, okay? Now we're gonna move to something totally different, it's abdominal CT. This is something is uh, absolutely, I absolutely love uh, abdominal CT. When I just started with CT, I never realized uh, how much this was going to change the way I, I work and how I make my choices. It remains clear that radiographs and ultrasound will suffice in most cases. CT is not uh, the go-to modality for every animal. And here's where we go into the, into the differences uh, between countries and continents. Most abdominal pathologies that we see from our uh, United States clients and Canada as well, they tend to just investigate them initially with radiographs. Well, in Europe, very often the radiographs are forgotten, they aren't good enough, and we crack on directly with ultrasounds. Uh, where my personal uh, preference is, like, I will just say that I love radiographs, okay? I think they are very cost effective, but it is true that they have limitations. And ultrasound does have limitations too. So you are going to have the cases where neither of these is going to give you the answer. In those, obviously, you will start to think of CT, but there are certain clues that are going to start pointing towards the CT straight away. And this is a very simple one, large obese patients, okay, 60 kilogram Labradors. Uh, I don't know if you do ultrasound in my experience, anything that is more than, I don't know, eight to 10 centimeters. Yeah, the ultrasound can get much deeper, but the resolution is terrible, okay? Uh, you add to that the fact that the patient may be a bit painful, it doesn't let you push or is not well sedated or is panting and, and that ultrasound turns into a nightmare. So. Every time I see a, a, a big dog, and not just big, but also you know, with good body habitus, with a lot of body fat, I start to, to lean towards CT and push towards that because it's gonna save me time. It's gonna save my risk of pushing into that dog. And I know I'm gonna do, you know, I'm gonna give them a better diagnosis and a more useful study. And then for anything else where the anatomy is complex or so something that's anatomically complex and that complexity you need to know about for your surgical planning. So. Uh, to determine whether a mass is resectable, but also at the same time to look if it's metastasized or travels somewhere else. And then for all of the things that are truly anatomically a nightmare to evaluate on ultrasound sometimes. So portosystemic shunt, I love ultrasound for it, but uh, the, for example, most surgeons don't want to hear about it. They just want to see uh, that 3D recon or whatever it is. Ureters, biliary tree, particularly in big dogs, those kind of small things, uh, they are seen very well on CT. And then, yeah, for anything where, where you don't have a clear conclusion, you suspect the patient is septic, but you cannot find the answer. You want an answer, otherwise you're gonna delay the, the, the treatment. You, you may want to think of CT. And then, yeah, many others, depending on whether you have ultrasound and how good you are at it. There are lots of other in indications. We have lots of clients that will do lots of ultrasounds, but when the radiologist is not there, then suddenly they start to do a lot of CT, which, which makes a lot of sense. I'm not gonna play this, it's, 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 I'm, I'm not trying to see if anyone has got eagle eyes. Although knowing there is a radiologist, maybe I should. <laughs> this is just in case you've never seen a, an abdominal CT, just to see how clearly uh, you see everything inside. I mean, compare this to an ultrasound and it's a total different game. Uh, in that CT, you see, was a random example where, where I realized how much uh, CT can bring to the table. This is a, a severe acute abdominal pain in a young Rottweiler. By pain, I mean pain, this is not discomfort. And following the ultrasound, I could find a little bit of almost questionable changes. I could see the fat being a little bit bright around the pylorus area. Uh, and it just kind of didn't adapt. You know, this, this dog is, is properly painful. And this is just a close up of the duodenum here. And that's the lumen. And you can see the wall, there's a disruption, there's a penetrating ulcer here. You can see a couple of bubbles have escaped. Uh, and you can see that there. This can be a very difficult area to explore in a big Rottweiler, uh, you know, particularly, you know, if you happen to have some air in the middle, you, due to the pain, the abdomen is tense, you may not be able to reach the area in detail. Um, you do a CT and this is clearly surgical. This is a surgical emergency. Uh, this was dealt with by orthopedic surgeons and I think they were in and out in 25 minutes. They did a quick short enterectomy. You leave this 24 hours because you were unclear with your ultrasound. This patient is, you know, things start to look really, really bad for him. Okay, in 24 hours, once the peritonitis settles and it starts to be gas and, and gastrointestinal tract contents floating around, uh, chances of the dog pulling through are, are slim or, or definitely decreased. Uh, use some a random example of bilateral ectopic ureters. 
Uh, this one down here used to be see, for example, an insulinoma. So this is a small pancreatic nodule, which very often you get to see on, on ultrasound. But you know, if the dog is big and you start to get the colon right in the middle, it may be very, very difficult. And things like, for example, the typical metastasis or insulinoma, this is the arterial phase where they enhance very vividly. Uh, this kind of metastatic lesions, uh, you see them much earlier in my experience on, on CT. I've had cases where you see them on the CT, you put the ultrasound to do an FNA and there's nowhere to, to, to be seen. Now, I apologize, I, I, you know, it's a very broad topic and I, and I want to cover many things. So the result is that I speak very, very fast. Uh, so, so I hope you, you can still follow. And I'm just checking that we've got 99 participants. So let's see if you can convince someone else to join and we make it to 100. I think this morning we passed 100. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on to the thorax. Thorax is the logic one. I think, uh, you know, thorax and CT, they get on very, very well. Doesn't mean that it's an absolute categorical indication. Radiographs and obviously echocardiography will be still the modalities of choice or at least the starting point of most uh, investigations, okay? Sometimes we may, you know, skip this, for example, I know looking for meds, we may just jump straight into the CT. Um, but where, where CT is gonna be good and you start to consider it is when those two do not get you the answer particularly. So the radiographs are equivocal or they are not conclusive, or even if they give you your answer, you know, there is a mass, you know, you want to see better whether the lymph nodes are normal, whether I can remove it, uh, whether there are small nodules that I'm missing. So there's a lot to bring. And this is definitely something that we cannot cover. Uh, we take a few hours. But just think of anything that is in a thorax, whether it's the lung mediastinum pleural space or the thoracic wall, and pretty much every single thing, you see it better on CT than with, for example, radiographs, every single one of them. So the list of indications for thoracic imaging are absolutely massive. And, and you can see this, for example, I mean, I'm pretty sure we all would see this gigantic mass in a lung and we would see it on radiographs without a problem. But this gives us a lot more. Now we've got the different phases of post contrast. We know it's a solid mass. We know it's well vascularized. Uh, you know, if this was cavitated, you know, that could potentially affect where and how you sample if it's what you want to do, if take a sample or whether this is gonna be resected, uh, whether they are, you know, you can see the lymph nodes or like in this case, you can, you know, get some more clues even if, if this is, very convincingly neoplastic looking, but we can see a uh, systemic arterial blood supply following, uh, following a very abnormal pattern. So some kind of neovascularization going on. So everything is screaming uh, towards neoplasia. And if you look, actually, there's tiny little metastasis there and there. Uh, and this is just another case. I think I've got, uh, yeah, I'm confident that this, in this nodule, probably I will see them on a radiograph. Maybe knowing it is there, I may be able to spot that one. I don't know what you think. But look at all those other ones. There are other ones there, which are actually smaller than the vessels that are at that level, uh, that one up there. Uh, I don't think it's just got a chance to see those. So, so CT, it is clearly much better uh, than radiographs. But that uh, poses another question, which we will discuss. Vasculature used to show some examples of how beautifully we can see uh, the vessels and how we can reconstruct those vessels. And for example, here, the esophagus this is a dog with a aortic arch. We can see in which side of the esophagus. You can see that the arch is on the right, but we can see all the things uh, that potentially for the surgeon, I'm not one, but I think it could be very useful to know. Like if they open, let's say in this side, they're gonna encounter a vessel that shouldn't be there. So this cat other than the aortic arch and the, in the, in the abnormal subclavians, it happens to have an incidental left cranial vena cava, which may throw the surgeon and say, hey, hang on a second, that shouldn't be there. So the amount of information is, is tremendous, is, is fantastic. And that kind of poses a question. I think the answer is no very clearly to this, but can an imaging modality be too good at something? And why am I asking this? Uh, we start to get imaging modalities that give us so much information that sometimes it can be misleading. But not only that, let's just take the example of metastasis. I think we've already said that CT is much, much better than radiograph. So the same dog, you do an X-ray in a CT and you may have two different results. This is very common. And the result is that, you know, the absence of metastasis on radiographs is, doesn't mean the same thing as absence of metastasis on CT. And you will be wondering, how does this affect me? I just want to know this metastasis, let's do the best one. Well, it really affects you because you are gonna make a clinical decision based on pre-existing literature. You are maybe gonna find a study, say, okay, we've got this tumor. There's this study where, I don't know, dogs with metastasis, they did this. Dogs without metastasis, they did that. And to each group, they did one thing and the outcomes were different or whatever it is. If now you take that study and you don't realize that the study was done based on radiographic presence of metastasis, 
and you use CT. Now, suddenly some of the cases that in that study would have treated in one way, uh, you are gonna be doing something else. So you may not be given the right chance or you may be given a treatment or, or, or whatever it is to a dog where, you know, according to that study, it was probably not the right thing. So no, I don't think an imaging modality can be too good, uh, but what I'm certain is that the, the, the literature that we have behind all of the knowledge uh, that, that we apply to, to make clinical decisions may not be uh, based on as much information or, or, or the information may be slightly different and that can introduce a bias and, and, and lead to clinical error. Okay? So it's just one of those things to, to think uh, is that sometimes you, know, you may be getting too much information. Um, we're going to jump in a totally different topic. We're going to go into the head and we're going to start with the brain. And there is no way to approach this other than just to say that MRI is so much better than CT. Uh, it's not to waste around it. We can argue about whatever you want. Uh, this one, you will not convince me. MRI is better. So you start to look at normal MRIs and, and you see the beauty of all the anatomy inside the cranial cavity. You know the brain, cerebellum, brain stem, everything in between, cranial nerves everything. We can do different weightings when we have lesions. You say, okay, hang on a second, that's hyperintense in T1 peripherally, but the center is hypo, and in T2 is the opposite, and it enhances this way and that way. And this is going to give us a lot more information, and very often it will help us reduce or, or change in a better way the list of differentials, and other times it will just spot things that we miss on a CT. But we are here to talk to CT, right? So once we clear this, MRI is better. Does that mean CT doesn't have a role to play and that's absolutely not. I love brain CT. It's quick and sweet, it's fast to interpret, and it is actually not all that bad. So it can definitely play a major role in many cases. And one of the obvious reasons is that you may not be able to, to, to access MRI. It's not available everywhere. Or even if it is there, it costs maybe twice, three times what a CT costs. Uh, or you know the dog is not stable and you prefer to compromise and just, you know, just do a CT uh, because it's faster. Um, and, and not only because of those compromises and those uh, subjective advantages of it, but it is actually really good for certain things, trauma, hemorrhage, uh, or you are investigating also nasal disease, you want to know if it's gone through the, the, the plates. It is actually really, really good at that. It's maybe not as good as MRI generally, but probably good enough in many, many cases. But there is a caveat here. And the first one is that, you know, doing an image with CT of bones, everybody can do that. But when it comes to the brain, it's like going, I would say, like going to the races and you, you already have the horse that is the slowest. You know, your horse is not the best at this. And the worst thing you can do is on top of having the slow horse, uh, you know, cover his eyes or shoot him on the foot, okay? Uh, if you are going to try to do something that technically exceeds the capacity in a way of, of the modality itself, the least you can do is make sure that the images are optimized to the full. You can make the best brain images, but you have to be very careful how you do them. And that's something we will focus in the next talk, which will be uh, next week. Uh, also, you are going to identify inherent limitations. There are things CT cannot do. But very often, the advantages may actually outweigh those limitations. You know, if the clients cannot afford or they want to travel somewhere else to do an MRI, then it may be OK. Uh, this is just an image below. You can see it's the brain of a cat. And you can see how beautifully we can see gray white matter differentiation. I mean, there is still a lot of anatomical information we can gain with CT. And some of the things that you will see is obviously not going to do an exhaustive list, but so you, you can start to get an idea if you are not familiar with it. Anything that takes a space, we generally see it on CT, not because it's there physically, but sometimes even if we don't see the lesion itself, we may see that it's pushing other organs around. So what we call kind of a, a mass effect. Anything that has contrast enhancement, when you give the contrast, will be seen very easily generally. And anything that is different to the tissues that surround it. So if the density, the physical density uh, of the lesion or associated changes is different to the brain, you're going to see it. And edema, hemorrhage, mineralization. So even if you don't see the lesion itself, uh, if you see the peripheral edema, it's already potentially uh, something that is clinically useful. Now, when not to use the MRI, uh, I would think uh, you should steer clear from it when you, for some reason, require a very high sensitivity uh, investigation. A very good example is when you're trying to diagnose something by ruling everything out, uh, everything else out. Like, for example, with uh, uh, idiopathic epilepsy. The reason for this is quite simple. Saying that a brain is normal in CT is very different than saying a brain is normal on MRI. Something that is normal, on the, you know, brain is normal in MRI, that's got a lot more meaning to it than the CT. You cannot rule as many conditions, okay? 
Uh, so there are certainly indications where it may be better to, to steer clear, but others like this one, where it's probably the go-to modality, is a dog has been run over, uh, it's a young old, uh, young German Shepherd. First of all, we can see the bone beautifully. Look at the crack in the skull base. You can see actually that TNJ is also broken there. But when we go, go and look into the brain, we can see this is pre-contrast. You can see a hyperatonating lesion. This is a, a clot. We can see the peripheral edema, see it there. We can see how it pushes uh, the brain stem. We can see uh, the cerebellum herniated, not in this image, but one of the occipital lobes is also, it's got a massive uh, vascular kind of uh, like, like a big infarct, which we can actually see here. You can see this uh, hyperatonating structure inside the vessels is actually a clot. Uh, secondary to a trauma. So we do get to see everything we need to make a call and make a, a, an informed decision in many cases. And when you get your hands on MRI and CTs that match uh, for the same patient, uh, sometimes it's really like saying, okay, you see CT is not all that bad. Obviously you, you don't know what you're missing if you don't have the MRI, but in case like this, we've got beautifully uh, well delimited contrast enhancing uh, meningioma here, same appearance here. We've got the, for example, the peripheral edema, harder to say, maybe you don't see it in your screen, but uh, with, a, with a proper viewer, uh, we definitely see that uh, brain edema around it. And, you know, CT can, uh, you can do things like this. You can do a proper 3D reconstruction, make that lesion appear in the color you want. And this will help the surgeons or neurologists to decide, do we operate or what do we do with it, okay? So a little bit controversial, a lot to think about when it comes to brain, but when it comes to non-neurological head scanning, uh, you know, radiographs, I think nowadays it don't make much sense. I'm, I'm, I am that old. When I trained for most of my residency, I didn't have access to CT. And we got by, you know, I don't think we did all that bad, but it was, a, it was, it was a nightmare. I mean, I loved it. I loved interpreting it and taking them, but taking proper head radiographs, I mean, it's an art more than a science. And generally, you know, it's, it's not very rewarding. So we tend to avoid radiographs altogether. I think I will keep them as a last resource if CT is not an option. In ultrasound, I don't think we don't do enough of it, but anything that is peripheral, soft tissue, I don't say salivary glands, retrobulbar space, things like that, ultrasound is brilliant. Uh, but yeah, CT, it tends to be the modality of choice for most of this. It's, it's very cost and time efficient and the resolution is, is more than enough and, and, and often almost more than what you need. Doesn't mean MRI is not great, okay? If we are not doing MRI for the noses, it is not because MRI is bad, it's because it takes time. You need to anesthetize the blood. Okay, there are lots of other indications, but CT, like MRI would potentially be better at many of these things than CT, but it just has the disadvantage of cost and, and time efficiency. So I think we can say that for most things, things head that is not a brain, uh, CT is gonna do great, okay? It's gonna be the modality uh, of choice. Some random, you can see, you know, the list, the list of indications would go on and on and on, but just look at some of them, nasal disease, ear disease, I mean, this is a massive percentage of the caseload in any veterinary practice, whether it's first opinion or referrals. Uh, so, so I think, you know, if you are getting a, a CT scanner and you don't know where your caseload is gonna come from, you are, you are unsure. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of these things uh, that you may not straight away jump in CT because you didn't used to have it, they are gonna end in the scanner. Okay. Use a random example, just comparing, you know, sometimes you do the CT and you say, actually, I could see that in the radiographs. The turbinates are gone. There is some inflammation there. It's exactly what I, what I was thinking. But yeah, you don't know what you're missing uh, until you start to do CT. And now suddenly, you know, the career from place here looked pretty normal, but further caudally, there is actually a hole and there is a fungal granuloma growing in his brain. And if, you know, you look at these radiographs and you confirm this is aspergillosis and you do a antifungal soak, uh, this dog is probably not going to wake up. Okay, you are going to uh, toast his brain. And that happened uh, back in the day when we didn't do CT, every now and then one of these uh, aspergillosis soaks um, wake up with scissors or, or, or died on recovery. Okay. And just another random example that sometimes imaging is not used for diagnosis. So here I've, I've highlighted in blue and you can see it's got a, a foreign body there, it's a piece of stick. And, and to me, when I look at this on the CT, it seems pretty straightforward. You just cut there and take it out. Uh, but apparently it's not that, that easy. Through here, you've got the eye, through here, you've got the bone, through here, you've got the muscle. And also once the surgeons opened the mouth, um, the foreign body moved all the way up here and they just couldn't get it. Uh, so you use your imagination because CT allows you to guide also tools. And in this case here, we've got an arterial forceps and we use guidance, just put it in, repeat the CT, go back in, don't do this. Uh, don't stay in the room while you're scanning, please. Uh, radiation safety first, but you use positioning, move out. Okay, advance it a little bit, check where it is, and then you can grab foreign bodies. 
you can take biopsies of things. You can say, I can do that on ultrasound. Yes, you can, but you cannot see past this or you don't know how deep to go. CT allows you to do that. It allow you know, to sample certain lesions that are a bit deeper. Uh, so, so there is other things to it other than the diagnosis. And, and it's a little bit like, I always think as a radiologist, you are, you are often only as good as your ability to take samples because, because this is the pathology that makes diagnosis, not the radiologist. So CT is another tool that you can use to, to help you in that sense. I'm just gonna check quickly the time, 40 minutes. I think I'm doing a bit better than this morning, probably just talking much faster. Uh, yeah, this morning I, I didn't get to this part. So we're gonna use very, very briefly, I'm gonna go very quickly here. This is spinal CT indications. It's a massive topic, okay? This is a topic that cannot be covered in a whole hour. Um, the decision-making is, is a bit more complex than with other body parts. So radiographs, I think, you know, they are so available uh, and sometimes it still makes sense to start an investigation with them. Things like, for example, in this dog, this cospondylitis or a, or a fracture C2, uh, we can see them very clearly. But uh, I, I put sufficient, you know, would this be enough for the surgeon that is going to try to repair that? Or, or will not the medic that has seen the discospondylitis want to find out more as to why the dog has got an infection? Uh, so so it's, it's really kind of that the, the investigation of a spinal disease ends with a radiograph. Even when you add myelograms, which come with side effects and, and, and they are not always diagnostic. Uh, so CT is probably the next logic thing. So, okay, well, then let's do a CT. And CT is brilliant for looking at bone, obviously, for, for the, the vertebrae. We see them beautifully. But still for the soft tissues, particularly in the small patients, it may not be enough. Now, we can overcome some of those limitations with contrast, as I will mention. But generally speaking, I think if you've got an MRI scanner and a CT scanner, uh, most people would, uh, who investigate a spinal disease in those circumstances would jump straight to MRI. It is just superior, a little bit like for the brain, okay? But spinal CT is still massively used. It's got a lot of use to it. Uh, Using some specific cases, you know, it may be a little bit more of a challenge to diagnose. So what does plain CT be good at? We already say that anything uh, that is, uh, you know, bony or mineral. So assessing vertebral conformation, congenital, like, I don't know, hemivertebrae or abnormal facets, as an example. Mineralized lesions inside the vertebral canal. If all of the discs, uh, were like this one, we would only do CT. I would probably not have a job either, <laughs> but they are not uh, normally not this calcified and beautiful and you know you see them that well, okay? But if, if, if for example, you've got a disc and it's got some degree of calcification, you are certainly gonna see it. Uh, then whenever you have implants, uh, you just selected here a, a spine where they want to see whether that uh, screw went through the, to the right corridor and it just about did, didn't it? It's very close call there. Um, but you can see what implants or what metal, certain metals do. This dog had a craniotomy. And these are just little fragments from the burr when they are removing bone that remain there. And, and you can see how much it affects the image. That's probably a, a, a submillimetric piece of metal, uh, but it means we can no longer uh, evaluate the possibility of the tumor recurring, uh, at least not accurately. Uh, when is plain CT not, you know, what, what is it not so good at? Uh, this is where I think it starts to struggle. It's looking at the spinal cord itself, at the parenchyma. Is there gliosis? Is there edema? Is there a mass that is not enhancing? It is cavitated lesions, syringomyelia. Now, I could find you good examples on, on CT of every single condition. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you know syringohydromyelia, sometimes you see it beautifully, but it is not a very reliable way to find it. So if, for example, we think here, we've got a subarachnoid a diverticulum here on the top image, and we can see you scuttle to it all of this likely edema or a pre-syrinx and a bit of a syrinx going on here. Seeing this on a plain CT and even with contrast, unless if you do a halogram, uh, you know, you may be lucky and see this, but you are never gonna see that or, or very unlikely to, to see it, okay? So that's one of the, of the issues with it, but sometimes whether you need to know that or not, you know, sometimes you may just want to rule out compression. So what can contrast overcome uh, limitations wise? I think there are two types here, obviously IV contrast, very easy and very quick to do. You just shove it into the vein. The animal is anesthetized generally anyway, so it's got a catheter, it takes a second. It will improve the visualization of the cord because you will see the vessels around it and it will help you define it a little bit better. And it will also show any lesion that has enhancement uh, or the meninges, uh, any vascular pathology, or potentially peripheral inflammation. So you see a good example here on the left is a normal. You can see the cord surrounded by fat. Here that is kind of lost. 
And when we give the contrast, we can see the cores a little bit squashed. And we can see all of this area around the vertebra. This is just a big empyema. This dog had a foreign body eventual to the spine with a lot of like an abscess inflammatory tissue around. So uh, IV contrast can be extremely useful. And then the challenging one is the CT myelogram. It's well challenging because it takes longer to do. It's a bit more invasive but it will give you excellent sensitivity and specificity regarding spinal cord compression. So CT may not be you know, the best tool, but if you don't have MRI, you don't want to do MRI, uh, you expect that in certain cases, use a plain CT won't be enough, but if you give a CT myelogram, at least you can rule out or rule in the presence of compressive or surgical lesions in dogs, for example, with discs, okay? Uh, just uh, an example of where these limitations come from, just to show you, these two dogs are completely normal. This dog is a big dog, this is a small dog. And what happens in big dogs is that the spinal cord relative to the canal is smaller, so we get a lot of fat. So if you give me this image, I can tell you 100% that this dog does not have a space occupying lesion in the epidural space. There is no disc there, I know that for a fact, at least not a, a disc that is causing compression. But if you give me a little dog, particularly in, in some parts of the lumbar spine, they barely have any fat visible. Uh, so for me, it's very difficult to, to, to decide if, you know, the spinal cord, whoops, sorry, I tried to do something. I don't know why it's not letting me uh, command P here. So for what we know, that could be the spinal cord and all of this could be a mass or a non-calcified disc. And we are not gonna be able to say it because they could potentially have the same density. Now, um, this is where myelogram plays a role and you can straight away see how much better you see the spinal cord, you see the subarachnoid space around it. And you can see lesions, you know, that potentially, even if it's got the same density as the spinal cord, now we can see them uh, clearly as separate uh, entities, okay? And the same here in the sagittal recon. I'm just gonna conclude, um, yeah, we've done quite okay time-wise, uh, with a couple of trying to collect the thoughts of the things we have discussed. Now, uh, regarding indications of CT, these are really categorical. Okay, if someone tells you, you know, for these dogs with this thing, you always do that. Yeah, they are probably cutting some corners. Okay, it's not really a, a clear answer. It's just there are too many factors that come into play here. And um, I always see it as, yes, a, as a multifactorial uh, decision. Uh, also understand that CT may not be the best tool for that specific investigation but it potentially could be, well, you know, could be more than good enough. Uh, so you need just to understand the limitations. And once you understand the limitations, decide whether it's, you know, it's capacity to give you certain information outweighs uh, those kind of negative or, or, or limiting factors, okay? So you can still consider CT when it is not the modality of choice because of availability, costs, how fast it is, or based on whatever your client really wants, okay? Also think that if you're not familiar with CT, it may start to tell you things that you do not need to know or that you don't want to know. So it may overcomplicate things. So just try to use it wisely. Make sure the justification is clear. You've got a clear clinical question you want to answer. Don't just randomly start to scan full bodies or whatever it is, okay? And last, and is what brings us into the last slide, is that um, image quality is absolutely critical with any imaging modality. But I think with CT is, is sometimes have it challenging to optimize protocols. And, and sometimes people look at images and, and they find it challenging to, to decide is this image uh, diagnostic, could it be better uh, or whatever it is. So this is something we're gonna discuss next week is something I'm very passionate about. Uh, I am director of, of quality assurance. So I, I spend a lot of my time looking into imaging studies and deciding how good they are or not. I also look at, for example, reports of my colleagues decide, you know, how the quality is. But, but just looking at image quality is something that as a radiologist is natural. It's the very first thing you do when you open a study. And I think this is relevant to many people. Uh, even if you are not doing full interpretations, if you are acquiring images, if every now and then you open a study and look at it for interpretation or because, you know, you've done it and you want to know if you can cut this dog here and there, you need to be able to quickly and effectively look at that and say, okay, this is a very good city study, or actually this is rubbish. Uh, uh, you know, we, we need to repeat it or we need to reformat it. So I think the title uh, points more towards uh, when and how to do CT reconstructions, but it's, it's kind of a little bit of an overview of what a CT image is, uh, what this quality should be, how you assess those. So it will be quite a, a more granular presentation than this one. We're gonna go down into a bit more detail uh, so hopefully something a bit easier for me to prepare and to make sure that that uh, the audience gets get something out of it. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to do a very quick um, 
very quick poll, if you don't mind, is just to give us a little bit, um, a very quick basic feedback, basically. You just want to know how relevant uh, this might have been for you. Uh, and also just whether you've got any other topics. We are, we are planning in investing uh, more time uh, in, in doing this kind of training for our clients or for the general veterinary community. Uh, so if there are things you can think of that you know, could be useful for you, uh, you can suggest them there or at a later stage, you can always, always send, us, send us an email. Uh, while you complete the poll, I'm just gonna open the chat and the Q&A questions and answers to make sure there is nothing there that I need to address. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few seconds and I'll read this one. Ah, Rafael, thank you very much. Rafael confirmed we, we, we hit the 100. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question from anonymous attendee. So I'll read that one out. Um, says, is CT good for finding grass seeds in a pole? Huh. I'll be brutally honest. No, it's not. Um, if tomorrow you got a splinter in your hand, or a grass seed. I don't think people get grass seeds. I think not as often as as, as spaniels. Um, they are not going to do a CT on your hand, are they? They are just going to put a transducer. It happens to me very often that you know the eye of the dog is out here, kind of it's going to be case of talmus. We jump straight to CT, and then you find an abscess. Again, let, let's take a sample, but it's going to be quicker to go to ultrasound. So you bring it to ultrasound, and as soon as you put the transducer, uh, you see that grass seed beautifully. And even retrospectively, you go back to the CT, and there's no ways to see them. So grass seeds. Sometimes you see them, uh, but where I think CT is good at, because mostly you cannot get with, with other modalities, for example, for inhale or thoracic grass seeds or, or grass seeds migrating into, into far areas far apart. But uh, grass seeds sometimes, particularly when they are chronic, they are not dense enough, okay? Not all grass seeds are the same. Some of them may contain air or be very dense and you see them beautifully, uh, but tiny little grass seeds, you may miss them. CT will still allow you to know, you know how far there's a fistula tracking up the limb, how far that is going, or sometimes, you know, you will have a beautiful pocket of fluid and then you know where to tap, okay? Uh, but it is not always that you are going to see the grass seeds. Sometimes you are going to see the inflammation and the abscess, okay? So just let, let me know if, you, if that doesn't answer uh, the question. Um, so I have quite a few questions. I'll, I'll go first with those in the Q&A and then I'll jump back onto the chat. Uh, Paul, uh, you ask, should respiration be suspending for all thorax and abdomen scans? Ah, okay. Now, this is, uh, this is an, another very difficult one. If you ask me, ideally, yes. I think it pays uh, to do it. I think you are less likely to, to miss things because of motion, but uh, you need to also consider uh, your clinical setting. Um, some people find it not practical or it just adds cost, or they may need to involve anesthetists to do it, uh, and they prefer to avoid it. Uh, so some people will do them even conscious, you know, put patients in a cage and scan the cage. We see things like that. I am a little bit um, obsessive with image quality. So I personally like them, yeah, uh, not breathing. As they say, you know, if radiologists could, we, could work with their animals, we would choose that, but, but it is not what we do. Um, really depends on the, on the indication poll. If it's something that is, you know, a chronic condition or, or a more of an elective investigation, then definitely yes, make the effort. I don't know, it, it, it would be stupid to maybe miss a shunt or end with a suboptimal a study for investigating a shunt when you know you can just plan and stabilize the patient even for many emergencies you know it's this snake well just give it a day or just do a quick radiograph or even a, a thoracic ultrasound check there's no fluid the animal is patient now we sedate it and now we do it okay so yeah ideally yes but you can get away without uh, respiratory control okay uh, after the next uh, presentation I, I will share a link to our protocols which cover these kind of recommendations uh, I'm going to jump to the next question. And if, if it's not answered, just, just post another comment. Uh, Adele, uh, I can see a couple of messages here. Do you use contrast for orthopedic studies in case it highlights a soft tissue problem? Uh, OK, uh, for example, a lame dog with elbow pain. Well, for that example, definitely not uh, if I'm suspecting elbow dysplasia. So contrast for orthopedic, like pure orthopedic, articular conditions is really of need. Uh, the cases where you are scanning limbs and you want to consider contrast is things such as, for example, 
a hot swollen joint where you may suspect infection, whether you, you know, suspect it could be neoplastic, or sometimes we want to see if a certain tissue enhances. But for most straightforward cases, I don't know, fractures or, or even, uh, yeah, elbow dysplasia, contrast is not going to give you much. Okay. And I'm, I'm here narrow it down to, to IV contrast. For example, for shoulder pathology, some people are very keen in arthrograms where we inject the contrast directly into the joint. I'm not all that keen, to be honest, but other radiologists would disagree with that. They may have a, a valid point. Uh, but I think generally speaking, uh, proper orthopedic disease, even if it affects tendons, contrast is not always rewarding. So most cases we don't do it. Uh, Uh, this is a question about timing for IV contrast. This, this was asked this morning as well. Um, Adele, that's an extremely challenging question. It depends on the body area. It depends on the specific indications. You don't do the same timing if you're, I don't know, investigating maybe a, a, an insulinoma or, or a shunt or, uh, you know, whether it's a brain study or a limb study. Um, I think I'm going to write that, uh, down this one as an idea for, um, for future. Uh, training, uh, really. Uh, but it, there is not a clear answer, Adele. It really is going to depend on the area and the indication. Um, it's going to jump on uh, Sven. I hope pronounce the name right. Which 3D printers would make sense for printing a bone entity preparing for surgery? This is something you'll uh, refer to a, a medical printer. I don't know much about 3D printers, uh, Sven. I have to be honest with you. We used to do this as a service at VCT. Um, we had access to, to printers, so we prepared the volumes, get them printed and sent to our clients. Um, but I don't know about the specific types out there. I think most people that are using this regularly, <clears throat> they tend to use uh, services that are specifically designed for this. If you are not looking into you know, getting implants or guides custom build for that implant, you just want to grab that bone and hold it in your hands and see how you're gonna cut it, uh, there is not necessarily the need for a specific medical printer. There's lots of online, uh, printing services, but you will need to be able to prepare the volumes uh, into the adequate uh, file format. Uh, so if something you are not familiar with, it may make sense to, to check what's available as medical services directly that you can send them the DICOM study and that they can work, uh, they work, can work with you to, to get you exactly the bone that you want printed. Uh, but I'm really sure that there will be printers out there that uh, may not be even that costly nowadays you can have and, and run it yourself. Um, I'm gonna jump to the next one. I hope that answers it. Uh, Shelby, for vestibular disease where it could be central or peripheral, would it be better to the rats to assess bullae and MRI to assess the brain lesion? Because they say it's inappropriate. CT is inappropriate study uh, for geriatric patient with severe chronic health tilt and possible history of ear disease. Hmm, it's a very, very good question. Um, I tell you what I wouldn't do. I would not do generally radiographs and MRI. If I'm going to do an MRI, the radiographs are not going to tell me anything. You see the bullet beautifully on an MRI. You see the ear canals. Uh, you see the cochlea. The 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 you know all, all of the anatomical components of the vestibular system. Um, but whether I would go to CT, I can tell you that it is a very very common uh, thing to do uh, because CT, what it will do is will allow you to rule out with certitude if there is middle ear disease. So let's say you've got uh, otitis externa and the dog has got a vestibular sign. Um, chances are if the bullae are normal, it's nothing to do with the ear, okay? And with that history of being a geriatric patient, then it's a bit of an exclusion diagnosis. Now, as I mentioned for exclusion diagnosis, you want to choose a modality that is more sensitive, that can pick up more stuff and that would make MRI more logical. Um, but I can also tell you that uh, for this kind of investigations with, uh, you know, we, we've got, uh, we are a global company, we've got, uh, clients in many, many countries. Uh, in, I would say generally most of these end having a CT done. It's maybe not because CT is better. It's just, you know, the, the, the difference in price and, and those compromises, they seem to be reasonable for most people, okay? So there is not a clear answer. To me, it seems a little bit extreme that the referral center will not give you a quote. Um, it depends how the referral service works. Some of them would do direct imaging, so it is for you to decide. And then you tell them, no, I want a head CT. Uh, but if they are seeing the case and they prefer to do the MRI, it's up to them. I, I would say, you know, a CT is better than not getting an MRI. Uh, so so the, it does contribute. And again, most of the time, what you really want to rule out is that uh, that, that vestibular syndrome is because of extension of the, of the otitis 
uh, towards the inner ear and CT can do that. Okay, shall we go? I don't know if, if that, I would be almost curious to know which referral service that is. Um, I'd like at antoaxial instability, would CT be superior uh, to X-ray? It depends. Uh, I like X-rays a lot um, because they are very quick and you can almost do them, well, I wouldn't fight with a dog with a latoaxial, but uh, sometimes you deep sedation, you put them on lateral, do a slightly flex and overflex the neck. Uh, and you know you, you will be able to confirm, yes, there is subluxation. While CT, very often we tend to approach this as a static modality. So you put the dog in a position and acquire it. Uh, so there's a chance that you kind of realign the joint and you don't see it properly on the CT. You, you lose that ability to, to see this dynamically. So X-rays, X-rays are not a crazy idea at all, um, and potentially, yeah, to, to some extent, it, it may it may give you information that CT doesn't. Um, would I do you only CT if I had the case? I, I would still consider if I didn't have access to MRI, I would do both. If I have MRI, I would jump to the MRI straight because even if if in the position you do the MRI, the the, the joint is aligned. Uh, if there's been a subluxation, you generally see spinal cord changes, so you are going to know what's going on there. Okay. Uh, CT may still give you additional information, you know, the, the shape and the position of the dents and things like that, but uh, but it's not always a, a, a categorical indication. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a well thought uh, condition where X-rays still have, a, a, I think, a, a lot of interest. Uh, yeah, radiographs still still have some interest. Um, got one more, Adele. Uh, do you have patients on fluid therapy uh, for a few hours after giving contrast to the flow system? Um, hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a good one. I tell you what, if, if it is a perfectly healthy patient, I mean, somebody's not healthy because he's having a CT scanner, but if there is no concern about renal function and it's an animal that is well hydrated, uh, I necessarily, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a clear cut necessity. Um, however, having said that, at least in the places where I've worked, uh, CTs are generally done under anesthesia and therefore there is uh, fluid therapy uh, connected. And generally speaking as well, we tend to where, where I've worked to use under the same anesthesia, do everything. So you do the CT and then may, you may jump to do biopsies or, or, or an endoscopy or whatever it is. So the patient is gonna stay anyway for a few hours. And even if you don't do anything else, the patient is still gonna recover from the anesthesia having fluids. So yes, most of the time they will, they will be connected to fluids, but I don't think there is anywhere where it's been proven that that is a, a critical thing to do. If there is renal, um, you know, concern of renal pathology, or if the patient is dehydrated, that's probably even more important, uh, then contrast should either not be given, or you have to make sure that you actually put the patient in fluids before the scanner, ideally for a few hours. And if there is no rush in doing the imaging, just keep it even overnight and make sure it's very well hydrated, do the study, and then keep it for a few hours, okay? But in animals where there is no concern in that regard, uh, I don't think it's a critical thing to do. Uh, in fact, I know some people do a lot of sedated CTs where they wake them up straight after, uh, and they don't necessarily keep them on fluid therapy. But yeah, it's, it, it, it makes sense to do so. I mean, I think it is good practice to try to, to make sure is everything is flushed. Uh, and we've got one, uh, Dr. Norbert. Um, when the patient is having concerns regarding the spinal pain and after the CT is confirmed discal degeneration in the early stages, uh, there's one. Let me just read this one. Uh, Wow, it's a lot of information for a radiologist to take on. <laughs> I barely know what gabapentin is, let alone the dose. Um, radiologists, like uh, most other specialists, you know, the more we specialize, the more <laughs> the more hopeless we become at, at everything else. That is our outside of our specialty. Um, how many months uh, re-examination of the affected area? Dr. Norbert, I don't think I can answer this one. I, I think this is the ones that I will run through through neurologists. Uh, Bet CT is not just radiologists. We've got a lot of specialists. I don't even know how many, uh, probably around 40 or 50 of them. And we always have neurologists around to ask these kind of questions. Um, so I don't have a, a very specific answer. I think it's a, it's a very precise uh, question and, and I, I would be afraid to answer it without giving it further consideration. Okay, so the question for everyone that cannot see it, I don't know if you guys can read this is, um, you know, when you got CT uh, confirming discal degeneration in the lumbosacral junction, in a case with, you know, that is responding to GABA painting, uh, how long uh, would you re-examine the, the patient or, or repeat the imaging or something like that? I don't know. I can tell you my experience, lumbosacral disease tends to be very slow progressing, okay? And it's a hard one 
uh, to be honest, because um, this actually explains very well what we mentioned about uh, what you know, how, how very often what we see in imaging doesn't really correlate with what's happening on the clinic. A lumbosacral disease, we see it very often as subclinical. And the severity of the imaging changes does not correlate with the severity of the clinical signs. And that, that's, that's very clear cut like that. You will see horrible looking lumbar sacral spines in those that are perfectly fine. And you will see those that are crippled lame that can barely stand up with a relatively small compression of a nerve root, okay? So I don't think, I, I think my, my idea is definitely months and potentially years, but I think more than having a, a clear answer to this, I think the, the, the decision, it will be more based on to how the dog is clinically progressing, okay? If there is no clinical concern, you've got it under control. I don't think repeating the study at a regular interval is gonna give you much, that's, that's my idea. And I'm just checking if all of the questions that are here in the chat have been passed on to the Q&A. And if that's the case, I think we'll finish this webinar. Okay, we've got some suggestions for another uh, webinar. Um, okay, great. We've got quite a few uh, future like suggestions for future meetings. Okay, so I just want to thank you uh, very much. I think we've gone just seven minutes over the hour. Uh, so I apologize for the slow delay. Uh, if you can think of any other uh, ideas or suggestions, you can send us an email. If you've got any other questions about, about the presentation, anything was covered, or about VetCT, uh, you can obviously reach out at, at any time. So thank you very much, and thanks for coming, everyone.